Our second speaker is Stefan Turner, who will speak of why it could make sense to understand how evolution works, finally, after 10 to the 10th year. I have known Stefan a lot longer, not a lot longer, a little longer than Helga. Stefan was a participant in the first big conference organized in 2007 by the Institute Paralimus with the title Science Without Boundaries. Sydney was at that conference as well. But it was only after Helga's first visit to NTU that I met Stefan again. That was in the process of getting the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna going. Stefan became the president of that hub and subsequently a speaker at our conferences and a regular visit to, visitor to NTU. He is now visiting professor at NTU and he's closely associated with the Complexity Institute. Thank you, um, dear members of the Evolution Club, for the invitation. It's an immense honor to be in the Sid, Sydney Brenner Show. Um, and it's a tremendous challenge to give a talk after Helga. If she gave us a talk, on, uh, if she gave us a humble view from inside of evolution, I will give you a superficial, technocratic view on evolution. Um, according to the notation of Sidney Brenner, evolution is now around for 10 to the 10 years, 10 billion years. Now is the present. I think I did an error here. In the, it's not the 11th talk, but the 10th. I should have put a 1 here, which would change to a 10 here. But it means we are in the present. 10 billion years of evolution, we're now in the present. The question presently is, do we understand evolution? And I think it's fair to say that not very well. And this is what I would like to show you a little bit. Um, and I would like to show you a little bit that we are doing better and better, but we're still not there. So why should one understand evolution? Evolution is a universal thing. It does not only apply to biology, it applies to, to uh, economy, to society, to basically every complex system that we have on the planet. Evolution is particularly important, as Helga already mentioned, to modern society. Modern society, in comparison to non-modern societies, depend on rapid evolution. It's essential to, to reinvent our society basically every 20 years. If we are not doing that, we lose being a modern society. We are losing, we are maybe losing the edge in comparison to other societies that we have had for the last 300 years. So we have to keep up innovation rates at every cost. That's at least the dogma that we, we have. And the third important thing why we should try to understand evolution much better than we currently do is that evolution is not only a concept of how things get more and more diverse and creative, but it's also a concept about the opposite, namely collapse the destruction of, of systems. So if we understand evolution better, what will it help us to do? Will we be able to understand economic growth? Maybe not, but we'll see what I mean. I will show you an example that we did together with Ricardo Hausmann from Harvard. Can we speed up innovation? Maybe not, but this is what we are promising in our scientific calls. Um, to what it might be useful for. Can we predict regime shifts? Maybe not, but you will see what we can learn about regime shifts that we don't know yet. So we, as Helga said, we can make a little step in the, in the right direction. Can we understand systemic risk of systems? We're getting better at this. Um, and can we predict the future? Of course not. So, there's one sentence that summarizes my interest in, the, in, in evolution. And that's, evolution happens gradually, slowly, most of the time. But from time to time, 
it happens disruptively. That's where all of my interest is, and, and I think um, it's important. So disrupt, by disruptive, me, I mean booms, busts, bubbles, collapse, mass extinctions, diversification, all of these words. i show you a couple of examples. This is the, maybe the most important uh, plot in, 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 in biological evolution. It shows the number of species or the, the number of genera on the planet since the past 500 million years. What you see here, in, just look at the green curve. What you see here, that this is not a nice and continuous curve, but we see about 10 times rapid mass extinction events. So we, you know, we have had five mass extinction events of species. We are now in the sixth that's currently ongoing. And what you see here is that you have situations where in a couple of 10,000, couple of 100,000 years, you lose up to half of the species that were living on the planet. This is tremendous. So how can this be understood? Many people are believing in, in meteorites falling down on Earth, changing the climate, etc. But this, would, may, this maybe explains how you get a mass extinction, but it does not explain how you get the opposite, a boom that's happening at the same speed right afterwards. It's hard to think of a, that every time a meteorite falls on Earth, we have diversification. So why should that be? Um, another plot is commodity prices. Uh, for evolution, evolutionary processes on the, on an economic scale, what we see is that for five years, ten years, we have stable situations, then a crash, stable situation, a boom, stable si a crash again, etc. On a shorter time scale, we all know stock um, price time series where we observe the same thing: a few really big crashes, a few really big jumps. Uh, I'm not saying that pr stock prices are a particularly interesting evolutionary system, but it's, it's an evolutionary system. Some historians, I took this from a, from a historian, see different eras of, of, of culture as different levels of diversification. In the Bronze Age, for example, we had just a couple of tools that we could make with everything up to bronze after we entered, a, after a disruptive change, we entered um, the era of iron. We had the Industrial Revolution bringing us up to, to a different cultural level of diversification, possibilities, etc. So in biology, this is what you always see. This is di diversity of species. This is time. And you have these periods where things are basically in an equilibrium. But this equilibrium is punctuated and changes to another equilibrium. Biologists always plot it in a way that goes up. But you can, of course, also have the, the opposite. Um, biologists call this, since the 60s, punctuated equilibria. So it's an equilibrium that's punctuated, changes in rapid steps to other equilibria. These transitions are the thing of interest in evolution, or the main thing of interest. We have fantastic theories. Evolutionary biology has fantastic theories about these states. Um, but for these, we don't have anything. Um, and at these transitions, things are tr getting crazy. It, it, they're re, re establishing itself. And diversity is going up and down. It's not clear where it's going to end up. So, that this is the case in biology, that you have these, these messy transitions, is shown in, in the biodiversity extinction intensity in the in, in sea, um, in the maritime world where you see here that the intensity, once you get extinction events, they stay around for a while. It's not that things happen very shortly. If you have, if you have um, 
systemic events, they stick around for a while. Volatility is clustered, if you are an expert. So these transitions matter. Each transition is a revolution, if you think of it. Each transition is a regime shift in the biological, in the biological diversity time series. After each, after each um, extinction event, we have a new geological um, era that Helga was mentioning. So during these transition events, huge risks are involved for everybody around, because no one is sure if he or she or it will survive, can be a species or a product or uh, whatever. And uncertain times are, will be around for long times. In statistics, this means that we have, when we look at diversity time series, that the number of extreme events is very large. It's rather the rule than the exception. And we have a huge number of outliers, statistical outliers. So let me show what I mean by that. Here I show the GDP of the United States, how it grew over the past uh, 40, 50 years, 60 years. If we look at the change of GDP, so how this curve changes from one quarter to the other, this is the changes of GDP, we see huge outliers, huge spikes uh, where GDP grows much, much faster in one or two years than in all the rest of the history. If you do a histogram of this, this is characterized by the distribution function, which is a power law. A power law, if you have a... Um, a distribution, uh, if you have a, um, a situation where you have many outliers, you have power laws. So power laws are an indicator for, for um, many uh, extreme events being present. The same is true for the number of business failures in the United States over the past 200 years, huge outliers which is represented in power laws in the corresponding distribution functions. Or on the positive side, the number of patents issued in the United States. You see that there's periods where there's huge dips in, in um, the number of ideas people bring to patent offices. Again, huge outliers very often characterized by power law. So, um, the Darwinian picture cannot understand these tra transitions. It's kind of ridiculous that we're thinking of evolution now for 150 years. We don't know how this transition happens. We don't, if, we don't understand why they exist. We don't understand the amplitudes, how far, how big these jumps are. We don't know how often they occur. We don't know the durations of these um, um, restructuring periods. And we don't know how bursty they are. Okay, so this is the questions we, I think we should understand better. If you take the Darwinian picture, this is the diversity over time. That's how diversity over time should be. It should in gradually increase. That's what Darwin tells us. So limited view. Where is science now? We, where, and where will the answers come from? Um, I, I think... They have not appeared in biology so far. Um, my personal hero in these questions is this gentleman, suspicious looking Austrian. He um, was the first minister of finance in, after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he was fired after only four months in office for complete incompetence. What did he do next? He started a bank, which ben went bankrupt shortly after, and he had to flee the country, he had to leave the country. He was a financial criminal. So what did he do? He took a professorship in Germany for economics. And um, when the Germans found out that he was a hunted criminal, he had to flee Europe, and he went what, to the United States, and what do you do there? You become a professor at Harvard. So, this is um, Joseph Schumpeter, 
who, by the way, always wanted to be the best economy, economist on the planet, the best um, horse rider in Vienna, no, the best horse rider in Austria, and the best lover in Vienna. And toward the end of his life, he said he accomplished two of the things, but he did not say which one. So he was revolutionary in the sense that he understood that economy, the economy is an evolutionary process, and if you don't accept that fact, it's like playing and performing Hamlet without the Danish prince. That's a nice saying. So what Schumpeter got right is that its evolu economy is evolutionary. It's constantly out of equilibrium, whatever that means. That means these jumps are there. Economy is algorithmic. It's path-dependent. It's totally forgotten in mainstream economics today. Economy evolves in bursts. He coined the term gales of destruction. So this is these bursts between transitions. And he coined another word that's very important. It's called creative destruction. This is if you invent a new object, a new thing, you, uh, this, this new thing might be so successful that it destroys and drives out already existing things. This is a mode of operation of evolution. The classic mode of op operation in evolution is filling ecological niches. Creative destruction is something like the opposite of this. A niche is not something, so in creative destruction, you don't assume there's a niche, and then evolution goes on, and then you fill that niche, but that you bring new things in that disrupt everything, and the niches follow maybe in the past if you want to describe it, but the niches are not the real objects. It's the real object is the new things that, that, that um, have a huge impact on the environment, on the context, and change the context forever new other things to come. Schumpeter did not understand the mathematics of what he was saying. Otherwise, he would be standing here. And it would not be, um, even if he understood the mathematics behind what he said, it wouldn't have done him any good because he wouldn't have had a computer to, to, run, to run it. So what is the traditional view of evolutionary dynamics? Helga mentioned one person who, is, who built his career on this equation. It's the replicator equation. Um, and um, people call it, quite ridiculously, the equations of life, etc. It, it says that the, the change of amount of a species i, it, the change, the rate of change, is proportional to how much of that species is around now times its fitness. F. Um, it's a very simple view of uh, evolution, but that's the dominant thing. It allows you, what this is very good for, for what this is very good for, is to understand the dynamics at these equilibria. But it does not allow you to understand the transitions. Yeah. So how do new things appear? Let's come to our, to our own view. And we want to keep it very simple. New things appear through the combination of existing things. Point. End of story. Full stop. Um, so that's what evolution largely is. Or that's a prerequisite of evolution. So we need things. This can be things. Uh, this can be goods and services or species or products or methods or ideas or papers, whatever you want to think about. And you need rules, rules of how to combine these things. You can combine certain things, and you cannot combine other things. And there's rules. There might be rules. Whether we know these rules or not does not matter. There is rules if you can, can combine two things or not. So there is a rule that if I have a block of steel and if I apply a hammer on it, I can make a knife. There's a rule that if I combine oxygen and hydrogen, I get water. There's a rule that I, if I combine glass with some electronics, I get an iPhone. But there's no rule that if I combine a fish and a chicken, that I get a dog. There's no rule for that. Probability for this to happen is zero. 
And there's no rule that if I have one block of uranium and another block of uranium, if I put them together, that I get a big block of uranium. I will not get it. I'll get an atomic explosion, which von Neumann was important to calculate that too. Um, but I will not get a big block of uranium. So if you would force me to write down an equation for this kind of uh, dynamics, it would involve 2x here. It's a nonlinear equation. But we're not doing this. It's much more complicated than, than the, the traditional um, uh, evolution equation, the replicator equation. And now the rate of change for species k depends on the abundance of two species and the rules. If you can combine i and j, then I can produce k. That's the equation behind it. And what every normal person would now do is try to solve this equation. It's a differential equation. And what are differential equations for? They're there to be solved. And, um, but it's nonlinear. So that means your solution does not tell you much because it depends incredibly sensibly on, on your initial conditions. And if you imagine that you have billions of products or millions of species that you want to model, this is absolutely useless. So we want to do something like having this equation, but on a discrete form, not, not, not differential here. It's just for the experts. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you what the kind of model is that we will do. You will think it's absolutely infantile and childish of what we're doing, but I'll show you what we do. We assume there's a huge and infinite set of rules out there. It's rules if, that tell you if I combine this thing with that thing, I can produce a third thing. Or if I combine this thing with that thing, I get that thing. Whether we know these rules or not is irrelevant. We could, there was a rule that hydrogen plus oxygen gives water way before we understood that rule. Yeah? So this is out there, but we, we, we're not knowing it. Um, if a thing is present, I, I, if, if a thing really exists, I draw a blue ball. If it does not exist, I draw a white ball. So none, no, nothing exists here. It's just the rules. It's not the things. If two things exist and there's a rule that I can combine them, I produce, produce a new thing. That's what I just said. Or if I have two things that do not exist, I cannot produce a third thing. Or if not everything that's necessary to produce the third thing is there, I can also not produce it. Is that clear? So what is reality? Reality is the rules plus the things that are actually present. So these two things are present. This is whiskey and this is ice. I can make a drink. I combine the drink with me. I get a drunken me, and then I, I, I don't know what, what we can <laughs> do then. Um, but yet the process then stops here. This is, is populated. This we can observe. You can observe the ice, the whiskey, and me. Um, we don't know if these other things exist because we do, we're not observing it, and we, maybe we are not aware of the rules. Yeah? So this is our basic model of evolution. Um, let me, it's not yet the model. Let's assume that from time to time, once every million time steps, we randomly turn a white dot into a blue dot. Something falls out of heaven. A new thing appears. A new, something completely different that did not need any, anything else. A new element comes to the planet. Um, and from time to time, one out of a million time steps, we take a blue thing and delete it. It's um, just destroyed by external forces, by the will of God takes out a species. OK, so if we do that and tell the computer, please now. Um, um, simulate what we're doing. 
you're getting this. Let me explain you what that is. This is here. On this line, I show 100 products. If the product exists, I draw a black dot. If it does not exist, I draw a white dot. So the black things exist, the white things do not exist. There's 100 possibilities, so we have infinite possibilities, but I just show 100, it's better to draw. And we see that for long times, the same thing exists. Then we have a short disruptive period, and then different things exist. Then we get another disruptive period where nothing is clear, and we get another more or less stable period. So in terms of diversity, it's just we count how many black dots exist in one row. We see that we get things like this, equilibria here, equilibrium here, equilibrium here, and in between we have these bursty transitions. And if you do a statistics of this, we, you get a power law distribution, which is exactly of the kind that we were observing in all these processes before. Okay, and depending on this innovation rate, this rate from how, how, how often new elements come through meteorites on the planet or how, how often spontaneous things are developed, if this innovation rate is too high, we never settle to, a, to an equilibrium. We're inventing everything all the time. This is very creative, but very annoying. <laughs> if your innovation rate is too low, you come to a stasis. You have a little bit of, of activity going on in the beginning, and then you, you, you reach a state where nothing is changing. This is the Middle Ages in Europe, for example. Um, where for long, long times, nothing changes in your products, in the products you can buy in a store, for example. Now, this is very, very, very simple. This is almost too simple to be called a model. So we made, in a decade of years, in a decade of uh, scientific activity, we made lots of variants of this model, applied it to usually economic circumstances. We changed the, the, these networks. Uh, we changed the competition or selection mechanisms. We changed how we, uh, how we actually create and destroy things. And very important, we also imposed the limit, limited resources. So you can, of course, create everything all the time if you have unlimited resources, but you have limited resources. How do things change then? The answer is, all of these model modifications, whatever you do to that, that model, is irrelevant. The dynamics is the same that comes out. This is some, something that's um, sometimes happening in physics, that you have something that, that is universal, that does not depend on the details, like magnets, for example. So if you did not follow me, here I'm showing you in, in pictures. We have this rule. I combine two things, I produce a new thing. So this is the set of things that are present now. Limited set. And we identify all things that we can combine. And then we produce new things of that. The, the newly produced things after the next time step become part of the establishment. They become old things, existing things. And then I can take these existing things and find new Co ways of combining to produce new ones. Okay, this is um, this is what I've told you so far. This is not yet evolution. This is just the creative part of evolution. Where is the selection mechanism? Selection is important in in evolution. I've not told you anything about this yet. Assume we have another set of rules, and that set of rules tells us if I combine two things. In the next time step, I kill another thing as a consequence. If Schumpeter gave, always gave this example, that if I combine the combustion engine with, a horse, um, with, with, with wheels, I drive out the horses, or the horse carriage industry. So in this sense, we have another set of rules. It's again this infinite space of rules that we might know or might not know. Typically, we don't know it. And now we combine these constructive rules and the destructive rules. We start with an initial set, 
find the constructive and de deconstructive rules and kill and produce things. The new things become part of the environment, the destroyed things go away. We do that again and again and again. And if we don't have limited resources, it will go on. If we have limited resources, this will become a stationary equilibrium at some point, which has these disruptive events and goes to an, another, another equilibrium, leading to these, to these dynamics, to these zebra plots. So now only two slides only for, for the experts. What is this? This is a dissipative um, driven system. This is a um, sand pile model type of system. It's a self-organized uh, self critical system. Um, since most of you are not uh, into complexity science, maybe I'm, I'll skip it. But just for the experts, this is a sand pile like dynamics behind it. And what do sand pile type models give us, they give us the, the, these, these, these correct power laws. So it's, it's naturally connected to what we already know from other fields. What I don't want to skip is this plot. We could prove, um, inspired from, from work of Stuart Kaufman, the following thing, that every evolutionary th system that is of the kind that I've shown you has this phase diagram. What is a phase diagram? I'll show you here. This is the diversity in the initial set. This is how many things we have now. On the z-axis here is the diversity at the end of time, or after, let's say, 100 years. And this here is the number of rules that we have, the density of rules. How often is it possible to combine any two picked random randomly picked uh, object to, to be combined. And we see this thing, if, if you have, let's say, God has fixed the number of rules. And it, it, he fixed it to the number six, so we are on this line here. And as we increase the number of things in the starting set, if you have a few, we are sub critical threshold. We are below a critical mass, but there is one thing, if we add one more thing in the initial set, it makes boom, and we go to a completely new situation where we have a highly diverse environment. What is maybe more important for us is the other way. So if we are living in a highly diversified environment, as we are now, if we are kicking out one species too much, just one mouse species, for example, we can go to a completely collapsed phase extremely fast. And the, the, our tragedy is that we don't know where on this plane we are, how far we are from the cliff. This we don't know, but we know that the cliff exists and the cliff is steep. So this is what we can say at this point. So we call this model, just these balls combining. The combinatorial, I know Brian Arthur would, would call it combinatory, but we, we use continental English, we can use combinatorial. Co-evolutionary critical model. Co-evolutionary means that, that um, we have this network underlying the, the dynamics, combinatorial means you have to combine things, and critical means that it produces these correct power laws and it, that it has such a cliff. So now if we take data and see how good our model does, we take the classic example first. We take the fossil record, the number of species as we think they existed during the last 500 million years. The data is the, the blue... Um, the blue curve, and here's the lifetime distribution of species. How long did species exist? You can use the model to make a model prediction, which is the, blue, uh, the, the red line, which is extremely good for what has been understood before. The green line is just the, just the other extreme of the model that you see with changing one model parameter, 
we can in understand everything that's in between that range, between red and green. If we look at GDP statistics of different countries, this is the data that I showed you before. before. It's exactly the same plot. We can get um, exactly the same slope, the, sl the same functional form of the curve. That it is shifted here is of no relevance. You just have to um, um, adjust the sizes. If you have power loss, the shifts don't matter. And here is a, an example from the reaction rates of the chemical reactions that are happening within the E. coli bacteria. We can also make predictions from our model. The red curve extremely well fits the, the blue empirical data. So for bi biological, for economical, and for, for paleontological systems, it kind of works. It's amazing. It's, and the model is really not more involved than what I've shown you. Now, um, a thing that we are very proud of is this test that I will show you as the last thing. Um, can, we, can we decide if in evolutionary processes we have the Darwinian picture where we have ecological niches that are maybe changing over time, but these niches exist and they are filled by the process of evolution? Or do we have the mechanism of creative destruction? Creative destruction was a new thing, is so disruptive that it completely changes the environment and, and the whole thing. So we went to world trade data. This is data that shows you which country is shipping which products at what price to what other country. And this, can, this is now a very good data set that goes back to the 1950s, 1960s. And you have about 5,000 different project, um, product classes which are shipped around. And um, this exists for every year, this data. So what does it need to make a product in a country? You need people who have the skills of doing that. That's obvious. But not all countries have all skills within a country. Uh, countries like Singapore, uh, like Germany, like US, China, they have all the, the, the skills that are needed to produce basically everything, every product that exists in the world. But there's many countries who don't have the skills to produce, um, 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 I don't know, a submarine or something. Um, if countries have the skill to produce something, usually the thing is produced. And if something is produced, very often it is sold, and also sold to neighboring countries. And um, this we can then pick up in the world trade data. Now we have to make, every time we, do, we apply our model to a, a real situation, we have to make sense of what these rules are and what these, these, these little balls were. And in our case here, um, these blue squares are skills. If you combine one skill with another skill, you have a skill set that's necessary to learn a new skill. Yeah? So this can be you with your ability to read, and you meet a teacher who teaches you something. You can become a creative scientist that that's what produces a product. Skills sometimes produce products, sometimes they don't produce products. But if a, a, a skill is present, it produces a product. That's basically what we do to, to our model. We, we, we look on the skill side, then we try to, to set the model up in a way that the world might have looked like in the, in the some, sometime in the past, and then we let the model run. So let's just focus on this, on this panel here. Here we have all countries. Some countries we had to discard from our data set because there's simply not enough data. The Bahamas, for example, they don't produce anything, so they don't ship anything. They are not in the data. Um, here is the diversity of products 
of the different countries. Here is countries, highly de developed countries that produce basically all the products. Here is very poor countries that are almost not producing any products. This is African countries, sub-Saharan countries, etc. So the blue line, which you don't see because the red line is right on top of it, is the diversity profile of the goods produced in the world in 1984. This profile changes over time. In 2000, it looked different. The blue curve is the profile now in 2000. And the difference, so you, you see that this shoulder here is getting a little bit larger, meaning more and more countries can produce more and more things, while the poorest countries still remain poor. And the difference between 2000 and 48 is this profile here. And yeah, this is the change or the increase of diversity country by country over these 20 years. And what the model can do, the model is that is we've, we've fixed the initial condition of the model to this red, to the data in 1984. And then we just let the model evolve with these balls combining, etc. And we get, an ex I would say, a pretty good um, explanation or prediction of the diversity profile 20 years later. And also the difference is, is pretty good. So this is not one prediction. This is 100 predictions. For every country, we make it. How good is it? Sometimes it's, it's very good. Sometimes it's not so good. So for these countries, we, we completely miss it. But for the majority and, and the whole profile of the diversity dynamics on the planet, we are good. Here is how often do things appear in a country or, yeah. So here we have, again, the countries, 100 countries. And here is the, this blue curve here is the data. How often from one year to another do new things appear? So we find this blue curve. In some countries which are very poor, nothing appears new. In rich countries, typically very many new things appear. How many things disappear in a country? This is given by the blue dashed line here. And again, the model is the red curves. It fits the profile almost perfectly. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I spare you the last thing. If you just look at the movie of which things come into being in the, in, to the world from one year to the other, you will see that in many years nothing happens. But in other years, you will see that huge numbers of things from more or less the same technologies arrive at the same time. So things arrive in the same, arrive in clusters. Um, why is that? Because technology is modular. Why does our model capture that? Because our model is intrinsically modular. By combining things that you can later on combine with other things produces a modular structure. And if you destroy one, one part of this, you might erase a whole, a whole um, um, branch of a tree, which then gives rise to these dramatic effects. Very often, these trees are redundant, that, that by deleting one thing does not destroy it. But if you um, hit the right species and delete them, you can reach such massive events. So things appear in bursts. You can just read that off in the World, Date, World Trade Database. And now um, we invented an index. We named it after Schumpeter, the Schumpeterian Product Index. If that index is positive, new industries push out old ones. This is creative destruction. And if it's negative, products fill niches, meaning that some business went out of business, leaving a business opportunity, and then other, other managers find out and fill that spot. So, and to a very subtle degree, you see, just look at the red curve. This red curve is this Schumpeterian, um, 
Schumpeterian product index, um, which is shifted a little bit to the right. That it's not centered exactly around zero is an indication. It's modest, but it's an indication which is highly significant, 10 to the 10, by the way, um, um, and shows that Schumpeterian creative destruction is happening and not the Darwinian niche filling. So we, we thought that was um, interesting. So this is the case. You can look at this, this index country by country and look at regions, and you see more or less how different regions are, are um, engaged in, in, in this, how strongly they are engaged in this creative destruction. And one example that I really like is if you look at Eastern European countries before the transition when they were communist, they did not invent many things. They did not invent products that drove out other things. The Schumpeterian product index is exactly centered around zero. And after the transition, look what happens. They become, <laughs> they become inventive. They, they start producing things that drive out all things that happen particularly strongly in the Eastern countries, in the European Eastern countries. Yeah. OK. Um, that was my last slide. Do we now understand what evolution is? A little bit better, I think. Um, so I wanted to convey the message to you that we know much about evolution for the stationary situations, but not for the transitions. And we are mo making modest, modest progress towards understanding the size distribution of these transitions, how big the steps are, the distributions of durations, how on average, how long these um, periods will be, how often they occur, and how bursty they are. All of these things um, you can compute from the statistics of this CCC model. And it, yeah, um, and we could show that in, in innovation, not in biology. Biology would be a triumph if we could show that. But in, in, in economic innovation, we could show that creative destruction is taking place and not the niche filling thing. Last thing is to thank my collaborators, Rudi Hanel and Peter Klimek, who are um, former students of mine um, and are now um, professors and associated with the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. Stuart Kaufmann, who is in Seattle, at the Biocenter in Seattle, and at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. Ricardo Hausmann, who has just been appointed to be an associate faculty of the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. And if you now are interested in what the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna is, let me uh, also mention that Helga is part of it. Um, if you got interested, please visit us if you're in Europe. Thank you.